Defamation statute of limitations. <laughs> but I, I, I don't know what you mean by they, like, like, it's media. Yeah. Oh, okay. Come on. Come on, I'll get you. Come on. The voice is the voice of the wife of sitting Supreme Court Justice Samuel Alito threatening the media, promising to, quote, get you reporting factually on the open biases that she and her husband seem to have displayed. Martha Ann did not stop there, expressing her desire to be able to openly express her hate for the LGBTQ community. Take a look. You know what I want? I want a sacred heart of Jesus flag because I have to look across the lagoon at the pride flag for the next month. Exactly. And, and he's like, oh, please don't put up a flag. I said, I won't do it because I'm deferring to you. But when you are free of this nonsense, I'm putting it up and I'm going to send them a message every day. Maybe every week I'll be changing the flags. There'll be all kinds. I made a flag in my head. This is how I, I satisfy myself. I made a flag. It's white and it's yellow and orange flames around it. And in the the middle is the word vergogna. Vergogna in Italian means shame. It comes on the heels of audio of Martha Ann's husband, sitting Supreme Court Justice Samuel Alito, talking about his belief in Christian nationalism, needing to, quote, win against the left and the struggle to live peacefully with those he disagrees with. We should note NBC News has reached out to both of the Alitos. We have not received any response. Joining our coverage is Lisa Grave. She's the executive director of the progressive watchdog group True North Research and host of the podcast Grave Injustice, highlighting the right wing takeover of the United States Supreme Court. Also joining us, MSNBC legal analyst Christy Greenberg is back with us. She's a former SDMY criminal division deputy chief. She was with us yesterday when the first half of the audio was made public. I mean, Christy, I start with you. I mean, the cat's out of the bag there. We know from Mrs. Alito that when it comes to the flags that are hung, her belief is, quote, I'm deferring to you. So it blows out of the water Samuel Alito's cover story to Fox News journalist Shannon Bream when he threw his wife under the bus, when the first two flags, or the first flag, it was just the upside down flag that was also flown by January 6th insurrectionist. His story when the New York Times published that photo in the New York Times to Jody Cantor, the journalist with that scoop, was to Shannon Bream of Fox News and to say that the flags were all Mrs. Alito's idea. But Mrs. Alito telling Lauren Windsor, quote, I said, I'm deferring to you, talking about Sam Alito. I think a lot of the facts about the timeline also are, are facts that really should be looked at more closely. I mean, Justice Alito sent a letter to Congress and, you know, said that these at least one of the flags was being flown in response to a dispute with a neighbor. And the neighbor has come forward and said, well, look, that flag was being flown well before there was any dispute. So this should be investigated. We should be looking into this and we should be troubled. I mean, these words from Mrs. Alito, yes, she is not a Supreme Court justice, but she lives with one. And, you know, she should really think about spending less time flying flags and more time, you know, actually heeding what she claims to be her religion. She's a Catholic. Well, she should learn to maybe love thy neighbor and also think about stop spewing this kind of hate. I mean, it's just so troubling to hear someone just have this kind of Hey, just for seeing someone flying a flag, uh, it really tells you kind of where the level of our public discourse is in this country. I mean, Lisa Graves, it also tells you about the radicalization of the households that possess, you know, at least one of the nine human beings who make up the Supreme Court. You know, I walk into 30 Rock and it's Pride Month and I don't think twice of and I feel good about seeing the flags on the plaza and the decals on the window. And the idea that what Justice Alito's wife sees is something so odious to her that, that we shouldn't let that bigotry and hatred. I mean, that if that view prevails, if that view is sanctioned, if that view is normalized, we roll our country back 50 years. That view is odious. And that view embodies another moment in time. It is not 
the world we live in today, where 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 marriage equality is the law of the land, where upward of 70 percent of Americans believe it should be, where bigotry and bias and hatred towards same sex marriage and same sex couples was, I think, most people thought something that they could look at as the past. Not only is it the present, it is the cause. It is the thing that makes her stare across a lagoon and feel such hatred. She has made up a new flag, one that spells the word shame that she would like to fly. It really is extraordinary. And I think you put it beautifully, Nicole. These are signs of progress in our country that people can live uh, and marry the person they love, that we can have equality respected. But here you have a Supreme Court justice's wife who is acting with such aggression and such hostility. And it's not just that hostility toward the pride flag, but it is this uh, uni this unity with these flags that were flown by people challenged. She presented herself. She claimed to be a religious conservative. The executive director of the Supreme Court Historical Society issued this statement on Monday saying, quote, we condemn these surreptitious, surreptitious recordings of justices at the event, which is inconsistent with the entire spirit of the evening. Attendees are advised that discussion of current cases, cases decided by current sitting justices or a justice's jurisprudence is strictly prohibited and may result in forfeiture of membership in the society. Earlier in the conversation, the activist told Alito that she didn't think that the right could negotiate with the left. Here was his response. One side or the other is going to win. There can be a, 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 way of working, a way of living together peacefully, but it's difficult, you know, because there are differences on fundamental things that really can't be compromised. It's not like we're going to split the difference. A little hard to hear. There are panels here. Molly Ball, senior political correspondent at The Wall Street Journal. Megan Hayes, former special assistant to President Biden. And Matt Gorman, the former senior advisor to the Tim Scott presidential campaign. Welcome to all of you. Uh, Molly Ball, uh, this, of course, I think underscores the pressure that Alito is under at the moment in our highly charged uh, political environment where the justices are about to decide whether or not Donald Trump is immune uh, in the January 6th case. Uh, clearly, he's in a situation where he is responding in the affirmative to someone he is encountering at a party. And yet, the remarks are still illuminating in terms of how he thinks about things. Yeah, I mean, I think, as you said, on the one hand, we've all done the thing where someone approaches you that you don't know and you just kind of play along, right? You just sort of say you're agreeing with whatever it is that they're saying. On the other hand, it's no surprise to anyone that he's a conservative, right? And that he does uh, ha view society as, as somewhat, you know, corrupted by a, a, a lack of godliness or, you know, I wouldn't be surprised to hear him say any of those things in, in a judicial opinion, for example. So it's all pretty broadly consistent with the judicial philosophy uh, and the political philosophy that we know that he subscribes to. I think also the fact that, you know, the, the, this recording is coming out tells you that increasingly the Supreme Court is being treated as another political branch of government. The, it, people are sending trackers after them, basically, mm -hmm. like they would with a political candidate, monitoring their every utterance and uh, looking through it for, uh, you know, potentially damning or, or politically useful uh, bits of audio that, that can be used against them in what's essentially become a full-time political campaign. And that, I think, you know, as we and others have reported, has contributed to a very high level of tension and division on the court itself that's made it increasingly difficult to function. Yeah, it's, it, it, speaking of division on the court itself, I mean, in this highly fraught moment that we find ourselves in as a country, uh, where there, there does seem to be this kind of looming question about violence. Certainly we have had more violence in our politics in in recent years than we had had seen in uh, you know in other modern campaigns with what happened on January 6th. Um, like I said, exclusive never before heard audio recordings of Justice Samuel Alito speaking to an undercover progressive activist. That's what we have tonight. That is in addition to the bombshell recordings that were released yesterday and you will definitely want to hear these recordings when we play them. If you've been wondering how those secret tapes were made in the very first place, how activists and judges on the highest court in this land, how they came to mingle behind closed doors, well, the answer to that begins almost 10 years ago to this day when the Supreme Court handed down a major decision. Supporters of the Hobby Lobby cheered today's victory. 
The Oklahoma family that owns the chain of 500 craft stores claimed that providing insurance coverage for some forms of contraceptives under Obamacare would be the equivalent of paying for abortion. The court's dissenters called the ruling startling and said it will allow companies to opt out of any law they judge incompatible with their sincerely held religious beliefs. The Hobby Lobby decision. The majority opinion in Burwell v. Hobby Lobby was written by Justice Samuel Alito, and it was one of the first signs that conservatives on this court were willing to go after reproductive freedoms no matter the consequence. Now, in the wake of the Dobbs decision 10 years later, Hobby Lobby seems sort of like the canary in the coal mine in more ways than one. In November of 2022, the New York Times offered key reporting about how the Hobby Lobby decision came to be. For years before the court heard the case, conservative Christians had been engaged in a campaign called Operation Higher Court. That operation was to personally court and influence the Supreme Court's conservative justices. And that effort was spearheaded by a man named Reverend Robert Shank, who would recruit Christian couples, whom he called stealth missionaries, to gain access to the judges and to impress upon them the importance of conservative Christian values. Here's how the New York Times described one of their strategies. Reverend Shank gave his stealth missionaries close instruction. The justices were more likely to let their guard down at the Supreme Court Historical Society annual dinners because they assumed attendees had been properly vetted. See a justice boldly approach, Shank told the couples, according to a briefing document reviewed by the Times. If given the opportunity, bear witness to biblical truth, but don't push it, he said. Your presence alone at the Historical Society events telegraphs a very important signal to the justices. Christians are concerned about the court and the issues that come before it. That strategy appears to have paid off. According to the Times reporting, some of Schenck's stealth missionaries were able to build enough of a relationship with Justice Alito and his wife, Martha Ann, that they obtained advance notice of the court's Hobby Lobby decision before it came out. That breach, that unprecedented breach, foreshadowed the leaked Dobbs decision, striking down Roe eight years later. And that specific strategy of using the Supreme Court's annual Historical Society dinners as a way to gain access to Supreme Court justices, well, it turns out that, too, is relevant again just this week. So, folks, what I've noted is that when it comes to the Supreme Court, its real power is in large part based on the consent of the people to believe in it. You know, the reality is... It acts like it has for so long because for so long, up until relatively recently, the last 20, 30 years, but you know, the country's hundreds of years old, people have believed in the courts more or less that they were, you know, at, if not always correct, then at least fair minded and all of these sorts of things. Now, that's not the case. And the reason in large part is because of the two senior conservative judges. Thomas in particular, when it comes to his insane wife and all of the quote unquote gifts he's received and Alito less on the gift side, but more now on his insane wife and their open embrace of politics in, in an uncomfortable way that goes beyond what you normally see, even from radical right wing judges and what they've done in essence is they've ruined their Supreme Court careers, reputations, and their status as judges. I don't care about their formal legal status. In the minds of the people, the court has lost legitimacy. And so therefore, every decision made where these two men, Alito and Thomas, have their signatures on it is rendered null and void, at least in my view. They are no longer actual judges in the moral sense whether or not they have their gavels and their robes. 